南无南无南无Thank you. Thank you, Cecil. I'm, I'm wondering if Hazel could just um, end the screen share um, so that we can see what see each other. But um, I'd like to welcome you to our event, Seven Days of Rest and Sacred Renewal. My name is Reverend Barry Burr. I'm the chairperson of Cape Town Interfaith Initiative as well as um, a member, a proud member of the Cape Flats Interfaith Declaration, as is Cecil. Cecil Plykis was born and bred in Cape Town, um, South Africa. He loves reading, he loves conversation, he loves listening to music and learning from others and from life. He practices Nisharan Buddhism and is a member of the Soka Gakkai International. Cecil describes himself as an educator and a transformation agent. And that's why we felt that he was possibly the voice of wisdom that it would be really appropriate to bring today to our very first in our seven days of rest series of wisdom sharings from various traditions. The purpose of course of seven days of rest and sacred renewal, um, which takes place from the 1st to the 7th of January, is to unite in seeding the new year with a sacred field of intention and a blessing for a thriving world for all of life. Together, we create a collective space for renewing ourselves and our sacred bonds with each other and with all of life. Cecil, welcome. Thank you so much for getting up at so early on the 1st of January. A very happy new year to you and to all of our viewers. Welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Reverend Barry, and uh, Happy New Year to you and Happy New Year to everyone watching uh, this morning. And thank you also for getting up so early. <laughs> it's absolutely my pleasure. And we are blessed by rain in Cape Town today. So, and what a joy that is as well, a refreshing start to our time of renewal. Yes, absolutely. Excellent. Thank you. Cecil, I'm going to ask you, um, you were born in the Cape Flats, raised in the Cape Flats, it's where you live at the moment. It's not an area where Buddhism is um, found in, in enormous numbers. So I'd just like you to run us through your path. We, you know, we learn from each other's paths. So perhaps you could just share with us a little bit about um, how you found Buddhism. Um, yes, I've always been a reader, and like you said, I, I never found anybody in my immediate environment that uh, either practiced Buddhism or even know much about the philosophy that, uh, so that I could speak to them. Um, so most of it at the beginning started through reading, whether it was non-fiction or fiction uh, reading. And then later, uh, in my teens, I, I practiced uh, some martial arts and uh, that introduced me to meditation. Uh, I've also done uh, a bit of yoga practices that uh, became in my 
mid-20s, a member of the Theosophical Society. That then led to a bit more in-depth study of uh, Asian philosophy. And of course, included in that would be Buddhism. Um, and of course, the society also allowed me to meet more people who include up either pra uh, practitioners themselves or who at least knew about the, the philosophy of Buddhism. As for um, becoming a Nichiren Buddhist, that's only happened uh, about 12 years ago. And I've been officially practicing now for just over 10 years. 10 years. So this, and this is truly the voice of wisdom and reason that you so often bring to our conversations, our interfaith conversations in Cape Town. Um, just the, the, the quiet reason consideration that comes from you is, is such a valued part of our interfaith conversations. And that's why I wanted to ask you today, we're in a time now of sacred rest and renewal. The theme for today is rebirthing. And I was just wondering, um, in terms of rebirthing, is there something that had to happen first? Is there something that we needed or still need to do to bring closure to the old year before we truly can give ourselves and commit? to the new year? One of the things in the philosophy of Buddhism is that now, this moment is the most crucial or the most important. But since you've raised the question about the past or yesterday or the old year, uh, there's another idea in that the past isn't done and dusted. In fact, the past is not dead. It is actually still very much alive. So by whatever we do right now, we can actually also affect the past. Normally people think, um, they may have heard the concept of karma. They, and you don't even have to accept the, 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 the philosophy of karma, but you just look at, life logically there that definitely what you do now can affect the future that seems to be fairly reasonable but uh, uh, the philosophy of Buddhism also states that you can affect the past so whatever happened in the past can be changed in some way by whatever we do today so this moment is always the most crucial whatever happened a minute ago or a couple of seconds ago can be influenced by what we do right now. So if there are, if there's anything in the old year that one is unhappy about, you are not powerless. You can actually change it right now. So is that really about changing our thinking about it? Yes. The, changing our uh, perspective, but, uh, the way we think, or reframing it? Yes. That's an interesting one because I'm sure that there are many things that um, that people would like to reframe about the past. It was a tough year, but I also think that um, being grateful possibly for what happens and what has happened because it has brought us to this place. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that I'm, I'm just wondering if what, what the role of gratitude is in Buddhism. Um, definitely, of course, everything that happens, um, we, we uh, normally put the value judgment to happen. So some things will be uh, thought of as good and others as bad and others as neutral or either or. Um, but all of those things make up our life or our life experience. So it's not just a matter of saying it is all good, because as we already we've judged some of it as not good, but they're all still part of our life experience. So we cannot deny the parts that are negative or the shadow side or the darker aspects about it. So the bad things that happened, they happened, right? but it 
is still part of that tapestry of our life. So last year, uh, to me, and I think to a lot of people I've spoken to, uh, was actually a lot more difficult than the year before, because um, in uh, 2020, we were in a situation, but we were still like hopeful it's going to get better soon, at least by uh, 2021. And it didn't happen. And then in 2021, we were sort of stuck because it seems like there's no end to this. And that uh, got a lot of people down and into even depression. So uh, all of that, we must accept that's part of our experience. We all went through it, you know, even whether we were chirpy and very upbeat about it, that was our life experience, right? And there's nothing, uh, it's not that there's nothing we can do about it, but it happened. So what we can do about it is right now. So by changing uh, our attitude, by accepting that which happened and the last year, by integrating that into our experience, it is part of us. And from that, we move forward into the new year. Thank you. So, so the idea of rebirthing and renewal is not really about um, pretending something didn't happen. It's really about making peace with it. Yes. And growing out of that situation. Am I understanding you? Yes, that's, that's, that would be it, yes. So, Cecil, thank you for that. And tell me, when it comes to a time like New Year, what, what does that mean to you in the Buddhist context? Is it, is it, is it a time that you celebrate and that you, and that you have a particular um, ritual or ceremony for? How do, you, how, do you, how do you embrace this time of the New Year as a Buddhist? And what is the philosophy of that? Yes. Um, in terms of the, the Soka Gakkai, which uh, Soka Gakkai International, which Soka Gakkai is a Japanese term, which means uh, value creation society. So at midnight, the change of the year, uh, uh, New Year's Eve going into the new year, uh, people meet informally and then they chant together. For instance, just this morning, um, I received messages of people which are doing the whole night. So they finished at six o'clock and they wished me well for this uh, uh, meeting, uh, for which I'm very grateful. And uh, so that's one practice. It is not uh, prescribed, but that's what members do out of their own initiative. Um, as an organization, we actually do have a morning meeting. So there will be, uh, under the circumstances now, there will be an online meeting happening later this morning. But usually under normal circumstances, that would have been a gathering of uh, uh, whoever is around in the centers in the, in, the, in the country. So those are the two main ways how we would uh, uh, celebrate it. But I want to mention something else. Uh, in Buddhism, because Buddhism exists in many different cultures. So one of the things uh, uh, that uh, we have is any cultural practice which is not directly opposed to Buddhist ethics and philosophy can be celebrated. And you can actually, uh, Nichiren, which is the founder of this particular school of Buddhism, uh, just suggested that uh, you can just chant a little bit of Namyo Renge Kyo, and then the festival is yours, whatever it might be. So depending on the culture you find yourself in. So it's like I said, it's just a fine line of as long as it's within the general ethics and philosophy of Buddhism, any festival is fine, you can participate into. So New Year is great. <laughs> So New Year is great. And, and just very briefly, um, you're bringing the philosophy of, of Buddhism into that. Um, I, I, love the, I love the chant, the idea of chanting through the night, but um, Buddhists chant really for, for others, don't they? They chant in order to make the world a better place. It's a very, um, 
yeah, it's a very almost cosmic philosophy, isn't it? That that the chanting goes out and brings an energy into into the world. Can you tell me yes. a little bit about that before we play a piece of music for you? Okay. Yes. Um, the chanting is really about energy and connecting with the energy in nature and the universe. So that energy is also in ourselves because we are a microcosm of this bigger macrocosm. So whatever is outside is also inside of us. So, but the practice always starts with oneself. So that's the chanting. So we generate the rhythm that's out there and we connect with that rhythm. And uh, the purpose of the chanting is actually to give you that energy to engage with the world because in Nichiren Buddhism it isn't just contemplative. So we chant, but after the chant we need to act. So that is really the, the approach of, 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 of chanting. And you're absolutely correct. Uh, uh, in general, whether it's chanting or any other form of, of Buddhist practice, it is actually a gift. So uh, we share the gift, whether it's a prayer, we share it with others. In fact, we, we, uh, we believe, like other religions do, that uh, ritual acts are, have, um, have merit. But that merit is passed on to everyone or to some person in particular that you want uh, to pass it on to. That's very beautiful. And, and I, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for that. Um, I, you, you have, um, we invited you to bring along a piece of music today, and I know that we're about ready to play that piece of music. Would you like to just tell us something about it, um, just very, very briefly before we, before we play it? What, what made you choose this as your offering for the new year? Um, it's a piece of music by uh, the harp player, uh, Andreas uh, Wallenweider, and um, it's a, uh, it's a very peaceful piece, but it's also got a bit of the rhythm. Uh, and it's not really so much African, but it has got that type of happy, energetic feel to it too. So I just, I just thought it, it, uh, it fits uh, uh, the Buddhism part of what we're dealing with, but also where we are uh, physically. It, it just blends those things. And of course, there's a lot more to the actual song because it is actually about the environment uh, and peace. And uh, by our peaceful acts, uh, we can protect uh, the environment. And that's really why I picked it. It, it just came when you asked me to, to look for a piece of music that one came immediately to mind. That's beautiful. Let's listen to that now. Thank you, Cecil.
lovely choice, Ethel. Thank you so much. I really appreciate Thank you, you Thank sharing you. that with us. So, Cecil, we only have a few minutes left to chat, and I want to take us back to the theme of rebirthing today, um, the, or today's theme of as part of the seven days of rest and sacred renewal. Um, we, we go through seven themes, and today's theme is rebirthing. I am curious to know a little bit more about what Buddhism brings to the process of rebirthing. How, what is your perspective on that? In Nichiren Buddhism, every day is actually a renewal. Um, in terms of the chanting, there's a morning practice and an, and an evening practice. But in terms of the morning practice, there is every new day is a new beginning. So you set out the day, uh, what you uh, want to achieve. And at the end of the day, you recap in terms of how much you have achieved. And again, if you haven't reached all your goals for the day, you start over again the next day. So it's always that rhythm. It's a continuous rebirth. Every day is, is in fact, uh, there's a, a writing by uh, Nichiren Daishonin, the founder of the School of Buddhism, where he actually says uh, the title of the writing is Every Day is New Year's Day. So you really start over every day. So it may be a different way. Normally, uh, people have uh, New Year's resolutions, which you know last for seven days or, or a month um, there. But in fact, this time you don't have to worry. You can just uh, reframe the whole thing and say, well, every day is New Year's Day. So uh, whether you've missed it yesterday, I can start again. Just do it again. So that actually comes directly from, from the teachings. Uh, every day is uh, a chance to, to renew ourselves. And we are actually renewing ourselves, uh, whether we are aware of it, aware of it or not. Uh, we are changing ourselves all the time. That's really beautiful. So, so it really was very fitting to have you as our first, as our first guest for yes, 2022. Absolutely wonderful. And um, what, what is your wish for the world for 2022? What, what is it that you would like to see more of in 2022? Happiness for everyone. And to get to that state of happiness, we need to be more connected to each other. So there should be more understanding, more conversation doing activities together regardless of what the particular activity might be uh, so that is really the way uh, often we look at changing or transforming society in very valid ways but we we lose uh, sight of what's actually what are actually the essentials um, so we look at changing societies but through laws uh, through economics uh, uh, through culture, social means, and they are all important. But actually, the thing that will make people happy is this relationship, this connecting with each other uh, and talking to each other, because that's how we relate, and also doing things together, activities. So whether it's sport, whether it's a hobby, um, whether it's an event, but people have to do things together. So those are actually the key things that that really makes people happy. Those other things are important, but you know, if we just focus in only on those, we don't really achieve that happiness. So sometimes we have a society where the laws are very good, but people are still unhappy. Or the economy is sound, but people are still unhappy. So obviously there's that element. 
in our society, of course, those other economics and uh, the rules and all those things are, are, are crucial. They are key. They are still things that needs to be addressed in those areas. Uh, they, uh, so they cannot be neglected. But still, while we're doing that, we shouldn't uh, neglect just getting together, talking, relating, and doing things together. So I want us to do all of that. That's all. Thank you. That's that's actually a perfect place for us to bring our discussion to a close. I really appreciate once again your time and sharing of your wisdom with us. Um, I wonder if you'd like to just close with a blessing for the year, in whatever form that takes for you. Okay. Um, I'm going to read. It's just a very short quote uh, from. Uh, Daisaku Ikeda, who is the leader of the Soka Gakkai International and also the founder of uh, uh, the organization. So here, here is the quote. One person inspiring another, transcending all differences. This is the basis of changing society at the most fundamental level. End of quote. Bless you. Thank you so much once again for sharing that wisdom with us. And I look forward to um, the rest of the week. Tomorrow we'll be speaking with Reverend Laurie Gaum, who um, represents the LGBTQI community and has what he terms the queer ministry. And we'll be speaking to him about that community's um, hopes and dreams and wishes for the following year under the theme of nourishing. Cecil Plykis has been our guest with us today. He's a Nichiren Buddhist from Elsie's River on the Cape Flats in Cape Town. Cecil, it's been a joy. Thank you so much. Thank you, Blackie. And once again, Happy New Year. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. <laughs>